All right, well, we'll see where this takes us. How's everybody today? Hi. I'm Dr. Yvonne Cagle, one of the NASA astronauts, and this is kind of a kind of t breathing time for you, a little bit of breathing space. How's that? Or a taste of space. We've heard so many amazing things. Heidi, I, I, this is the greatest compliment of all. I wish I were your student. Maybe it's not too late. Um, and uh, But this is a time to sort of give some context, perspective, or if nothing else, kind of see what your use, use case is here and just how, uh, how wild you can get with your aspirations. So I'm one of the astronauts, and I want to give you a little bit of a view from space or a view on space so that you can get a sense of the people who want to strap themselves onto a rocket and launch into the great unknown, sort of what's floating inside their head, because everything floats when you're on space, and for some of us, it even floats here in gravity. So, so let's get started. Um, it's going to be a little tricky for me. Let's see. Um, So the big question is, how does someone get from uh, get the opportunity or get to the trajectory in their life or career where they're training to fly at mock speeds while at the same time trying to, and I can say it in this group, hack the human body? Um, and that's sort of my situation. For me, it all started at the top of an old oak tree one hot summer night talking to the man on the moon, looking at the stars like so many of us. All of you grew up, I didn't actually. Instead, I heard this voice in the darkness calling my name, Yvonne, 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 and I thought, this is it, destiny has found me, and I was ready to take that giant leap. Fortunately, it's not a wise thing to do at the top of an old oak tree when you're 10 years old. Actually, not a wise thing to do at any age, buyer beware. But I recognized that voice was my dad calling me to come down, and all I could think of is this better be good, because I, this would be the last time I'd be listening or taking advice from any kind of parental gu guidance. Um, obviously, it must have been pretty good, because um, more than anything else, I'm still here today, and because that hot summer night um, was a very epic night. I walked into uh, our living room. My father was silently pointing to the old rabbit-eared TV. Uh, my job usually was, uh, out of six children, I was the one that had to hold and adjust the atten antennas for the uh, signal. Um, but this time, he was having me stand in front, so I knew it was something really important. And sure enough, it was, because when I looked, this is what I saw. Human. Walking on the moon for the very first time ever. Yes, that night happened to be July 20th, 1969. And at that moment, my dreams took wings. I actually ran outside to try to see if I could see the man on the moon. And I looked and looked and looked and I, I didn't see him. So I thought I missed and came back in and he's still walking on TV and I'm wondering, how is that? I didn't see him. Ran back out again and guess what I saw? Nothing. Right, exactly. So checked it out. He's still on. Ran back outside again and guess what I saw? Nothing. So, folks, I'm going to do this for about 25 more times. I never saw anything, okay? We're going to fast forward. But after about two hours, I suddenly realized the view in my own mind was even more epic because one day I, too, wanted to see my footprint on the moon. Fast forward, undergraduate at uh, San Francisco State University in biochemistry. On to the University of Washington. Ah, uh, Huskies School of Medicine. One of my professors, Lee. Uh, um, for my uh, medical degree um, on an Air Force scholarship, so I owed uh, a four-year payback, but 15, one, five years later, I was having so much fun yanking and banking in a wide variety of high-performance aircraft, from F-111s to F-15s, F-16s, 18s, helicopters, I don't know, air-to-air -air refuelers, medevacs, anything going to altitude, I wanted to be in it. Except after a while, about 15 years, I began to notice those jets didn't go quite fast enough, and even though I got to be the doc for the pilot, they didn't seem to go quite high enough. I knew then that the only way to go was up, and at that time, the only way to get there, wait for it, well, we're going to be waiting a while because we've retired it since, but 17,500 miles per hour, coming off of 7.5 million pounds of thrust. And it just keeps getting better because the vibration under your seat is so much that there's enough energy to launch 
or light up, talking about lights earlier on the panel, all the panels have been great so far, so really wonderful people, but enough energy to light up every opening ceremony for the Olympics in every city throughout the world. And the sheer force of the vibration under your seat is so great that it makes you close your eyes so tightly that you never actually see your first launch. You feel it. You're launched. It's been less than 10 minutes, 8 minutes and 30 seconds. You're approximately 250 miles above the Earth, going 17,500 miles per hour on your way to Mach 25. And as you unbuckle your seatbelt, you're floating. And the first word out of your mouth is, whoa. Guess what the second word out of your mouth is? <laughs> whoa. It just keeps getting better. Who needs solid rocket boosters? Who needs main engines? Maybe you need what our last speaker talked about, but you're in space. You're floating. And the view is spectacular. So folks, yes, we're going to Mars. I'm preaching to the pulpit. 2035 is kind of what we're looking at. But we're going to Mars, and again, by way of going back to the moon. And that's the exciting thing. Gateway, then Artemis. Now the dates are always slipping and sliding like it has its own slipstream, but basically we're 2020 now. Somewhere around 2021, we wanna kind of do a lunar insertion with um, our heavy lift vehicles and Orion kind of test it out. 2022, let's do some robotic precursor missions. 2023, maybe we'll see that first person doing a lunar orbit once again. And 2024, we're hoping for boots on the ground and some of the habitats that we looked at today. Of course, why are we going to the moon? Well, it's not enough to just boldly go, and we don't even wanna just boldly stay, but we wanna boldly thrive. And it's important for us to have some situational awareness and intelligence, and that includes knowing something about the surface. So um, landers like InSight that are going to give us some idea of not only the content and makeup of the surface of Mars, but also uh, its own kind of uh, history book or chronologic map about the universe and some of the impact craters, some of the seismic forces or even thermal capacities beneath the surface. And we may find that um, although we look for life in water, that we might actually find life somehow surviving in solid surface as well. We just don't know what we'll find. Um, we're also looking at something called um, a, a concept, and there's 30 universities throughout the world, 33, um, that are looking at something, I don't have, anyone know Melissa? Um, yeah, Melissa, I may not get it right, but something about microgravity, environmental life support, sustainable approach. Basically, it's looking at a closed loop system. Thanks, great, yeah, it's really exciting. Um, and when we talk about thriving, we need that habitability. And if we can demonstrate that in space, like somebody said on the panel earlier, we're really positioned to keep on going or to give Earth a break from us and maybe be able to go back in and take better care of it. But first, in order to survive off planet, we have to learn how to first and foremost survive. And that's the concept of Melissa. They're looking at using organic waste, be it from fish or humans or whatever, we're already recycling urine. But if we can, um, through a nitrification process, um, take um, nitrogen and be able to uh, make ammonia, and then from that ammonia, we kind of scavenge the hydrogen that can go in and break the bonds of carbon dioxide, releasing the O2, the oxygen that we can maybe store and use, and then attaching to the carbon so you've got methane now. This is a closed loop s uh, system that along with plants and photosynthesis may actually keep us going. What I love about all of this is they're great ideas and um, you know, uh, but they all have relevance here on Earth 
earth. So there might be parts and aspects that we can use so that we can have the wind even before we step off the planet. These closed loop systems can help us sustain environmentally, medically, and, and industrial, um, industrially, based, industrially based as well. But the other human that we have to take care of, the other system, is the human system. And certainly we want to make sure that we thrive. And we know with long duration that our body starts to decondition, our muscles weaken and atrophy, our bones start to thin out, our exercise tolerance goes down as our cardiovascular system starts to wane, and so much happens with our immune system and our, uh, our insulin resistance or our sensitivity to insulin. We're even seeing changes that happen with DNA shifting and um, the cortical areas of our brain and our gray matter. So much is still untapped, untold, but one of the areas is that it's not quite on our radar but needs to be is what if you're doing the very best you can and then you get injured and that's something that I'm looking at now is what happens if you're on Mars and you end up with a foot like this you trip or you get caught behind a panel or something like that a limb now you've got a muscle that would decondition anyway rapidly over time, but after a severe strain or sprain, instead of six weeks like we have here with gravity, you may have as a little six days before a limb becomes incapacitated. We don't know, but we do know injury is probably going to really accelerate that process, and we need to keep everything that we have. So what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? Well, we have a triathlete here who rolled his ankle and sustain this grade four sprain, x-ray, no break, but looking just at soft tissue alone, he has 10 out of 10 pain, can't weight bear, can't climb stairs, can't run. Here's the after picture. If you were to look closely, you could still see the taping remnants. The taping wasn't doing a whole lot, as you can see, but now he has no pain, can fully weight bear, climb stairs, and was able to make his marathon in three weeks um, only because he was able to get back to training and running in two days. The time between the before picture and the after picture, 10 minutes. Yes, minutes. Um, this is a, a, a non-invasive, wearable tech approach that places a very comfortable precision load on the limb and very similar to what Heather was talking about, is able to dance around the har harmonic and hitting just the right uh, kind of proprietary touch, we're not even sure exactly how it works and not to make any claims until we complete clinical trials, but it seems to be able to unravel the fascia that's knotted up and allow fresh blood flow to go in, swelling to go down, and function to return. So when you're on Mars, what's more important than even strength and conditioning is stability and balance. So that's an example of the human system that we want to look at. But of course, as we talked about, robotic precursors will precede us, and it's important that they have the lay of the land. We're excited as humans to work in com uh, complementary with robots because they'll do the station keeping, a lot of the maintenance, a lot of the sensing. They're our cloud, our early warning system. So we get to kick up dust and play. We get to do the science. We get to explore due date trips. So we're really excited about looking in conjunction with that. The few minutes left, I just want to talk about what it's going to take for us to go back to the moon, onto Mars and beyond. And the best way to be suited for space is to get suited up for space. So plain and simply, we'll need a protective helmet, we'll need a robust and hardy pressurized life support system, and last but not least, along with so many other systems, we'll need a sturdy pair of shoes, function-focused shoes that can give us that stability and balance over strength and conditioning. But it's not enough just to create or build out the outer hull. What's equally important, if not more, is the inner soul. It's not just about artificial intelligence. It's about the integrity of the soul within. It's so much more than bricks and mortar, so much more than polyester and piping. It's so much about the content of the character occupying the suit within. So the outer housing that we build out needs to be resilient and be programmed for adaptability and integrity of purpose. But what is maybe may most important of all 
is that inner space that occupies the outer housing or shell. That inner space that has a crowning helmet of honor and respect. That inner space that has a heart that brings not just the message, but the music to the vacuum of space. That inner space that through it all has an agility of limbs that makes even the stars themselves wish that they too had feet that could swing, sway, and swagger with the float. The most important component of that suit is the dreamer, you, with the courage and the will to believe that nothing is impossible. So at the end of the day, when you journey across the planet, in journey or search of uh, going back to the moon and en route to your Martian suit, never forget that even though this is my moonshot, the most important view is what's your moonshot. Because there is always, ever, space for all, because possibility is truly endless. Thank you. And that'll tell us. I'll turn it back over. Great. I'm, I'm your government worker who's your, your public commercial. So <laughs> these are just my opinions and nothing. Uh, anyway, this is a <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have about eight minutes before the start of the next session. So it's time for us all to start heading downstairs. <laughs>